Hey everybody, this is Dr. Chris Doss. Thanks so much for joining me today on my page, Biblical Languages and Literature. Before we get started, I want to let you know about some of the exciting course offerings in Biblical Languages and Literature that are being offered through Sabra Global Education, like Dr. Steve Notley's course, Jesus' Parables as Jewish Scripture. This is a great course for those who have a desire to better understand the Jewishness of the New Testament. The Book of Isaiah from Yesterday to Today which is an ongoing weekly course with Rabbi Dr. Robert Harris of the Jewish Theological Seminary, as well as my own course, How to Read the Bible, Tools for Studying the Jewish and Christian Scriptures. This is an eight-session class that meets one hour per week, in which I teach tools and methods for studying the Jewish and Christian Scriptures, including history, culture, and yes, even a bit of language. We look at just the basic elements of Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, And don't worry if you're intimidated by languages, we just deal with the elements so that the student can start to use more sophisticated print and electronic resources for studying the Bible. This course meets live from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time, May 10th through June 28th, but it's okay if you can't make the live sessions as each class is always recorded and uploaded to an online classroom. So be sure to register today. And if these courses might interest a group at your local church, synagogue, or learning group, Sabra offers significant group discounts. Contact info at sabraedu.com to find out more. All right, let's get to our video. So um, I want to combine the two fields that I love, the Bible on the one hand and Egypt on the other, and they inform each other in remarkable ways, or in the case of the focus of this course, Egypt and material from Egypt informs the biblical material, uh, especially in the uh, book of Exodus, obviously, and we will be focusing on that. And the, and the the attention is in different directions. There's the historical question. Everybody wants to know, did the Exodus happen? What kind of evidence is there for Israel in Egypt, for Israel leaving Egypt and so on? We'll address that. That's gonna be our opening session. But then there's also the literary presentation of it Um, and all manner of things such as Moses, starting with his birth, with Moses being hidden in a small vessel in the bulrushes. This is an evocation of the Egyptian myth of Horus um, holding snakes by the tail, which is how uh, Moses does this atop Mount Sinai in chapter four when uh, God gives him the power to do this. Uh, This evokes an Egyptian motif, turning your staff into uh, a a snake or a crocodile, which is what happens um, there in chapter four. And then the word tanin in chapter seven, most likely crocodile. Uh, This is seen in the Egyptian wax crocodile story. I mean, there are just so many angles from the historical and the literary. And that's just the book of Exodus. And that doesn't even get us to something like uh, the later books of the Bible where we actually have the names of pharaohs. I think everybody knows that when you read the Joseph story and the Moses story, it's just Pharaoh or King of Egypt. But when you finally get to Solomon in the book of Kings, we have the name of an Egyptian pharaoh, Shishak, uh, which is Shashank in ancient Egyptian. And then we get uh, later on in various books of the prophets, the names of pharaohs as well. And the prophets all have oracles directed at Egypt and they're evoking aspects of Egyptian culture, referring to the Nile and so on and so forth. So Israel has always been engaged with its great neighbor to the west, southwest, uh, Egypt. And I want to bring all that to light when I teach the course. Before we continue, I'd like to invite you to check out the class page for Dr. Rensberg's class. Simply go to the Sabra Global Education website and click Learn at the top of the page. Then select his class. And there you can get all of the class details and find out more about the course. To find out more about Dr. Rensberg, be sure to scroll down and click on the YouTube video link. Be sure to reserve a spot soon as space is limited. All right, let's get back to our video. And, and your publications, uh, I mean, you've written extensively on Song of Songs, for instance. Um, and, you know, many have argued that there is heavy Egyptian influence there as well. 
Um, tell us a little bit about your perspective on Song of Songs uh, and ancient Egypt. Is it important to understand an Egyptian context to understand Song of Songs? Well, on the on the surface, you could just read Song of Songs for what it is, just exquisite, beautiful love poetry. But you are right to point out uh, that the closest model to the Song of Songs of the Bible is Egyptian love poetry. And we have several texts uh, from the New Kingdom written in what we call late Egyptian. And we're talking uh, 13th, 12th uh, centuries uh, BCE. And uh, similar descriptions of the female lover, for example, which you get in the Song of Songs, especially. Um, and yes, I think the influence would be seen in Song of Songs uh, from Egypt. The number of themes that you get that are specifically Egyptian, you don't get necessarily in Song of Songs, although you do have that beautiful line um, with, um, you know, comparing the lover to a, a, a horse in Pharaoh's chariotry, you know, there's, there's nothing more beautiful than a royal steed, right? So uh, those those passages already echoing, echoing Egypt. So yes, there's there's even in the in the books would you where you I mean to point out Egyptian influence in the Joseph story or the Moses story you're going to say well obviously they're set in Egypt but even these other biblical books and Proverbs is another one which on the surface wouldn't necessarily have um, Egyptian uh, influence or the resonance with Egypt yes it's there to go back to your story before or uh, what you pointed out about most biblical scholars not being conversant in or, or, or fully trained, I should say, in Egyptology and uh, the Egyptian language. I remember uh, before my um, my exams uh, in my doctoral program at Jewish Theological Seminary, I had spent one summer uh, working through James Allen's um, Middle Egyptian grammar, and I in the fall I talked to one of my advisors, and he said, "Stop," <laughs> <laughs> and. I was so disappointed because, you know, I'd already had a pretty good handle on Akkadian at that point. Um, but he said, look, you've just got to focus on, you know, there's certain things you can do, certain things that we only have one life to live. And because of the nature of where my work was headed, um, he told me firmly to stop my uh, investment of time in Egyptian at that point. And, uh, Still a little bit of a sore spot to this day, but well, it it just goes to show that, you know, how valuable it is, um, just goes to show the audience how valuable it is to have a scholar, uh, a biblical scholar who is, um, you know, fully conversant in cultural, historical, and linguistic matters Egyptian. So, thank you, Chris. I won't ask which of your mentors it was, because I'm sure the person is a friend and colleague of mine, then you don't have to disclose I, who this is. Yeah, was. not saying anything further. So, <laughs> <laughs> But um, it, it is true, we only have one lifetime to do it all. And I will mention that, that you know, in graduate school, I also learned Akkadian, but that I have left behind. I don't, it's, it's the one field I don't work in. Um, so yes, and uh, for biblical studies, Akkadian is absolutely essential, but I'm always promoting the Egyptian uh, as well. I'll also tell people who know the, what these scripts look like, it's much easier to forget your Akkadian signs because to my eyes, they all look the same of various chicken right. scratch, but uh, the hieroglyphs remain with you because the owl remains an owl and the and the you know the snake remains a snake and they still look like the things all the time so it's just a visual imprinting of the hieroglyphs and we'll talk about how the hieroglyphic writing system works in our course as well we'll we'll make sure to uh, talk a little bit about that well i think you just uh, reeled in a whole bunch of students just with that statement alone but, uh, <laughs> obviously hieroglyphic is uh, an endless source of fascination to absolutely some. yeah so. Well, this is great, Gary. Uh, again, Sober Global Education and I are just honored to have you teaching for us. And we'll have the information on the course in the description down below in this video. And for those who are watching, we hope to see you in class with Dr. Rensberg. Thanks Thank a lot, Thank you, Gary. Chris. Looking forward to it. Thanks. 
To learn more about this course or any of Sabra Global Education's Bible and Theology courses, click the link in the description below or contact us at info at sabraedu.com, info at sabraedu.com. And don't forget to ask about our special group rates.